The senator from Arizona. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to set aside the pending business and call up my amendment uh, number four. Without objection. The clerk may report the amendment. The senator from Arizona, Mr. McCain, proposes an amendment number four, beginning on page 128, strike line five, and all that follows through page 141, line nine, and insert the following. I ask unanimous consent that further reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you know, we are celebrating President Reagan's 100th birthday this past weekend, and I uh, quote from him on many occasions. Uh, he inspired many of us in many ways, and President Reagan once stated, quote, government programs once launched never disappear. Actually, a government bureau is the nearest thing to eternal life we'll ever see on this earth. Um, I don't know if President Reagan ever observed the essential air service program, but it certainly, I think, fits his description. This amendment uh, uh, to repeal a $200 million government subsidies may not, may not be significant, $200 million in the light of a $1.5 trillion deficit this year is probably not a lot of money, but a lot of, of Americans on November 2nd uh, said they wanted us to stop uh, spending things that are not absolutely essential, although this program is called the Essential Air Service. In my view, it's far from essential. But the American people spoke on November 2nd. They said, stop the spending. Stop programs that are either unnecessary, have grown too much, or unwise, or even make some tough decisions. Now, in this bill, we're not cutting the essential air service. We're actually increasing it to some $200 million. Now, my colleagues may be uh, a bit confused by this, uh, this chart right here. But what it does, it shows, uh, and by the way, this uh, chart came from the FAA. It shows that 99.95% of all Americans, 99.95% of all Americans live within 120 miles of a public airport that has more than 10,000 takeoffs and landings annually. So, yes, there are some parts of America that represent the 0.5% of Americans, 0.05, 0.05% of all Americans who live outside of 120 miles from an airport that has 10,000 takeoffs and landing. Um, all the watchdog organizations, uh, Citizens Against Government Waste, the National Taxpayers Union, all of those organizations that watch what we do uh, uh, support this amendment. Earlier this month, Citizens Against Government Waste, President Tom Schatz said, quote, the non-essential air service has outlived its usefulness and is another reason why the country has a $14 trillion national debt. Now, a lot of Americans will be watching the vote on this amendment. It's not the first amendment to try to cut back on spending, but it certainly is, in my view, very symbolic of whether we are serious. Um, last week, in the President's State of the Union speech, said the only way to tackle our deficit is to cut excessive spending wherever we find it, in domestic spending, defense spending, health care spending, and spending through tax breaks and loopholes. As House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan has told many, quote, there are no sacred cows when it comes to spending cuts. Now, to put it bluntly, the essential air service is, quote, not essential. The program was created in 1978 when Congress deregulated 
the airline industry and allowed market forces to determine the price, quantity, and quality of service. Deregulation allowed most airline carriers to focus their resources on profitable, high-density market. That's the way the market works. In response, Congress established the essential air service to subsidize airline carriers that provide service to small communities at a loss because otherwise no sane business would serve a market at a loss. You know, as again, as Ronald Reagan once eloquently stated, government doesn't solve problems, it subsidizes them. And that's exactly what we did in 1978 by creating the essential air program. Now, with so many programs we've created, Congress initially enacted the program was supposed to last 10 years. It was only 10 years that we enacted this program while markets adjusted and communities adjusted. And then 96, of course, we removed the 10-year limit. And like so many programs the government has created, it started with a few airline carriers in a few communities and now grown to subsidize almost a, a dozen airline carriers in over 100 communities. You cover enough communities, you get enough votes, you keep the program going, and then you increase the spending on the program. Now, in this bill, the increased cost of $200 million. Again, not much in comparison to a $1.5 trillion debt, $14 trillion dollar uh, excuse me, deficit, a uh, $1.5 trillion deficit, $14 trillion debt, but it might be nice to start somewhere. Like so many other government programs, the, initial, the program was initially funded for several million dollars, now up to $200 million. A July 2009 Government Accountability Office report questioned whether the EAS program has outlived its usefulness, stating, quote, Current conditions raise concerns about whether the program continue to operate as it has. The growth of air service, especially by low-cost carriers, which today serve most U.S. hub airports, weighed against the relatively high fares and inconvenience of essential air service flights, can lead people to bypass essential air service flights and drive to hub airports. So, as I mentioned, 99.95 percent of all Americans live within 120 miles of public airports with more than 10,000 takeoffs and landings. In other words, fairly large airports. So let me give you a good example of uh, the kind of great expenditure of the taxpayers' dollars is. Last year, the Wall Street Journal published an, an, uh, an article entitled, quote, John Murtha's Airport for No One, which reported on an airport in Pennsylvania that has received more than $1.3 million over the past few years under the Essential Air Service Program. And the article states, quote, the airport sees an average of fewer than 30 people per day. There's never a wait for security. You can park for free right outside the gate, and you're almost guaranteed a row to yourself on any flight. The article continues, tickets to fly to Johnstown are expensive, even though every passenger flying out of John Murtha Airport has a $100 subsidy behind the ticket courtesy of the Federal Essential Air Service Program, which provides support to struggling airports. Um, so far, it's gotten $150 million of payments to what is, I quote from the article, called the airport for no one. Um, there are a total of 18 flights per week, all of which go to Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. The author goes on to say, I was visiting the airport from Washington, but because flights cost a pricey $400, I drove. The drive took less than three and a half hours and cost about $35 in gas not to mention that it was arguably faster than flying. And this isn't a remote area of the state. Murtha Airport is less than two hours from the Pittsburgh Airport. The airport has an $8.5 million taxpayer-funded radar system that has never been used. The runway was paved with reinforced concrete at a cost of more than 700 
million. The latest investment was $800,000 from the $787 billion American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to repave half of the secondary runway. Never mind that the first one is hardly ever in use. Well, the list goes on and on. That's just an example. Uh, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to have the article entitled uh, in Wall Street Journal entitled John Murtha's Airport for No One, the Los Angeles Times article entitled Planes to Nowhere, Congress Plans to Increase Small Town Airline Subsidies, and the Seattle Times article entitled Rural Air Subsidies Test Resolved to Cut Spending. Without objection. So, a Los Angeles Times article entitled, quote, Planes to Nowhere stated, in 2008, according to Senate Appropriations Committee data, Great Lakes Airlines received, this, received a subsidy of about $1.8 million for the 414 passengers it flew to and from Ely, Nevada, which is about a four-hour drive to Las Vegas. This amounts to $4,500 per person subsidy. Since the program requires companies to offer at least two round trips most days, some subsidized for, were, flights were almost certainly empty. Um, so um, it says, the article says, Ely is a beneficiary of Essential Air Service pro program established in the 1970s after airline deregulation, et cetera, et cetera, in 2008. The program, Ely, Costs very widely in part of differences in ridership. Glendive, Montana saw a per passenger subsidy of more than $2,000 for each of the 418 people who flew last year. The 23,581 passengers using the airport in Manhattan, Kansas only cost the government $50 and 82 cents each. Steve Ellis, vice president of the watchdog group Taxpayers for Common Sense said the program, quote, was supposed to go away over a period of time as we made the transition from deregulation. Congress made sure it hasn't. So, and then, of course, I mentioned the uh, Seattle Times article um, entitled, Rural Air Subsidies Test Resolved to Cut Spending. A program that subsidizes air service to small airports, often in remote communities, is shaping up as an early test in the new Congress of conservative zeal for shrinking the federal government. It goes on to say, a program that subsidizes air service to small airports, often in remote communities, is shaping up as an early test in the new Congress of conservative zeal for shrinking the federal government. Subsidies for airline passengers as of June 1st 2010 ranged as high as $5,223 in Ely, Nevada, as low as $9.21 in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, according to Transportation Department data for the lower 48 states. But critics say the airports often serve too few people to merit the amount of money spent in subsidies. Urban growth over the past three decades has also placed transportation alternatives other airports, trains, and bus service within a reasonable distance of some communities, communities receiving subsidies. So, studies show that in a lot of the, those communities, people drive to larger airports to get better service at a lower cost than they can get at the smaller airport, even with subsidized air service, said Severin Borenstein, a University of California Berkeley business professor who is an expert on airline competition. Some communities can make a credible claim they need the service, particularly in Alaska, but I think these are a relatively small part of the program, he said. The program has been remarkably resilient, partly due to the protection it receives from lawmakers from rural states and districts. It has been proposed for cuts or elimination many times over the years, but continues to grow. It's exactly in this political sweet spot, Borenstein said, lawmakers don't feel it's worth upsetting the few people the program serves to achieve what amounts 
for modest savings in federal budget terms. So, um, and uh, I understand, um, I received a letter from four senators that stated, eliminating the program will have a devastating impact on the economies of rural communities. I quote from the letter I received from four senators, and I repeat, eliminating the program will have a devastating impact on the economies of rural communities. I believe the real devastation to rural communities, big communities, small communities, medium-sized communities, if we don't stop mortgaging our children and grandchildren's futures, if we don't stop doing things that, was unnecess that are unnecessary. This program was put into being in 1978, was supposed to be there for 10 years, was a few million dollars, and now, according to this bill, it's going to be $200 million. So, it's about time that we match our, our rhetoric with our votes. And I believe that this will be a very interesting vote that we'll be taking on this amendment. And I'd again point out to my colleagues, all of these red dots are people that are served by, by large and major airports. And there are some areas of the country that are not. You will find that most of these are very sparsely populated uh, areas of our country. So I hope that my colleagues will vote in favor of eliminating this program that was designed for 10 years of life and now has continued on for some 30 years. And like Ronald Reagan said, that they are the hardest thing in the world to either reduce or eliminate. Mr. President, uh, I ask for the A's and nays on the amendment. Is there a sufficient second? It appears to be that there is a sufficient second. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to set aside the pending amendment so I may call up on behalf of Senator Leahy as amendment number 50, which is at the desk. Without objection. The clerk will report the amendments. The Senator from West Virginia, Mr. Rockefeller, proposes amendment number 50 for Mr. Leahy. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, no need to read any more. Without objection. Mr. President, um, I want to respond to the most interesting statements made, or facts pointed out by the Senator from Arizona and also the collective bargaining matter. But Senator Nelson is here with, I think, a particularly good amendment. And before we get to the 4.30 hour, at which time we're going to be debating judges, I want to give him a chance to talk about it. Mr. President. The Senator from Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank my colleague, the Chairman, for this opportunity uh, to rise today to discuss an amendment to the FAA reauthorization bill uh, which I will be uh, introducing uh, shortly. Uh, we're currently working with the uh, minority on some language changes, and this, this amendment will be proposed uh, uh, before long. And when it is, uh, I will be seeking a roll call vote on it. The amendment, along with, uh, which I've proposed, along with Senator Schumer, Kaka, Menendez, Whitehouse, Tester, and Shaheen, would make it a crime to photograph, record, or distribute a body scan image taken by a body scan imaging machine at either an airport or any federal building without express authorization to do so, do so either by law or regulation. I've heard from many Nebraskans who are concerned that the use of body scan imaging machines are, is overly invasive and their privacy is being ignored. And I too share these concerns. This isn't an abstract concern. According to news reports, the U.S. Marshal Service acknowledged last year that some 35,000 images from a body scanner at a security checkpoint at a Florida courthouse, court, courthouse had been saved. That's despite promises from federal agencies that these images wouldn't be stored. 100 of the saved images were leaked and some are now online for anyone to view. So an invasion of privacy has already occurred. 
Nebraskans and the American people understand that every step needs to be taken and every resource needs to be used to ensure the safety of our citizenry. Using technology to scan individuals for hidden weapons is a necessary, albeit sometimes unpleasant, aspect of making sure our airways and public buildings are safe. However, in the scope of doing such things, safeguards can and must be put in place to help deter individuals from collecting and using those images inappropriately. And this is the goal of the amendment that I and my colleagues have introduced, well, are introducing. I'm well aware that transportation security agency officials have said that the agency will not keep, store, or transmit images, but that hasn't and doesn't assure compliance. If passing laws or directives assured compliance, there would be no speeders in America. What is needed are additional consequences to make anyone considering keeping, storing, or transmitting these scanned images to think twice about the fact that they'll be committing a felony. If the consequence is enough of a deterrent, we will have better compliance, and the privacy of every American will be better protected. Now, let me explain very specifically what the amendment does. One, it makes it illegal to photograph, record, and subsequently distribute the, distribute the images taken by body scan machines in an airport or any federal building. Two, it imposes a penalty of up to one year in prison and up to a $100,000 fine for those who inappropriately collect and distribute these images. Three, it says that any individual who is acting within the course and scope of their employment is not breaking the law by saving these images or sending them if the purpose for doing so is to use these images in a criminal investigation or prosecution. So, Mr. President, by adopting this amendment, we will be telling the American people and my constituents in Nebraska that we are not going to ignore or compromise their privacy in the process of making sure we have safe airports and federal buildings. Our amendment takes a common sense approach to addressing this issue and why I'm seeking its inclusion in the FAA reauthorization. I thank you, Mr. President, I thank the Chairman, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from West Virginia. Um, in that we have a, a short reception at 4.30 and then we're going to the judges, uh, I, I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
The Senator from Iowa. I ask the further proceedings of the court will be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, today we're honored to have as our guest in the Senate the Prime Minister of the Republic of Slovenia, the Honorable Parat Pahor. He is the sixth Prime Minister since Slovenia won independence in 1991. As many of my colleagues know, the Republic of Slovenia holds a very special place in my heart. My mother came to America from the village of Suha in what is now Slovenia nearly 90 years ago. And I've been tremendously impressed by the great strides that Slovenia has made since breaking away from the former Yugoslavia. For the last uh, two years, Prime Minister Pahor, with great skill, has continued to lead his nation on a successful course of democratic and free market economics. So make no mistake, the success of independent Slovenia, like the success of the young American Republic two centuries ago, was no accident. It was secured by visionary leaders and by a determined people. Nine decades ago, my mother left Slovenia, a Slovenia that was impoverished, ruled by autocrats, dominated by foreign powers, a nation that sent forth immigrants desperate to find a better life. Today, free, prosperous, democratic Slovenia sends forth statesmen, diplomats, and humanitarians helping to build a better world. So again, on behalf of the Senate, I welcome our honored guest, Prime Minister Pahor. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate stand in recess, subject to the call of the chair, so that we may welcome the Prime Minister of Slovenia and guests on the Senate floor. Without objection. The Senate stands in recess. The Senate began today what's going to be a short work week. Democrats will be attending an issues meeting.